Okay, we can find the pigs. All righty. Let's get the two of Okay, so uh, y'all are here this morning. You, you've already heard the introduction, but I'm going to introduce them again in case you missed it. Some of y'all may have been sleeping in. I don't know. Um, so our speaker here is Dr. Peter Bowerstadt, and he received his BS from the University of Georgia, MS from the University of Georgia, his PhD from the University of Kentucky, and he has extensive experience in forage agronomy, agriculture, and ruminants. He was a forage extension specialist at Oregon State University from 1986 to 1992, and is currently the forage product manager at Barenberg, USA. And, and his personal experience led him to study human diet and health, and what he's learned doesn't agree with the low is low fat is healthy uh, dietary <coughs> advice we've been given for more than 30 years. And this understanding combined with his forage background has given him interest in the truly sustainable forms of agriculture, including women animals. So if you were there this morning, you, you, you uh, got that uh, mm -hmm. message a lot clearer. And so uh, I'm, after uh, we get started here, I want to uh, come back to and pass out an evaluation form. And I appreciate you at the end if you would uh, fill that out. We'll leave on the table, leave the back as you leave. And uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bell's staff. Thank you very much, Bruce. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, yes, uh, again, I am not that kind of a doctor. And I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Okay? So don't treat anything that comes out of the hole in my face as medical advice. Don't adjust medications you may or may not be on. All right? Uh, in some states, you can get in trouble for giving nutritional advice if you're not an officially sanctioned okay. human nutritionist. So, okay, we got all that. We're, we're good? Amen. Okay, good. I am, however, more than happy to share with you information that you can take to your health care providers to have truly informed conversations. Okay? Clear? Amen. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, okay. So my background, I am an agronomist. I'm a forage agronomist, ruminant nutrition. Um, so yes, healthy soils, healthy plants, the interactions between the two, the interactions between those two and healthy animals, right? And then as was mentioned in the introduction, you know, 10 years ago, I was, you know, a balding, obese, pre-diabetic, and today I'm just balding. <laughs> I don't have a miracle for y'all. <laughs> it's good enough, but the ball thing, I don't know. Um, as I've gone down this path, I keep feeling like, you know, it's this set of nested Russian dolls. And just about the time I think I got one of these figured out, open it up and here's another one, inside another one, inside another one. This, this subject can take you in many, many different directions. Um, and sometimes I think I've been given the gift of standing up in front of any audience and pissing off someone. Okay? It's, it's a given gift. And, um, you know, they, they say that if you're in a group of people that you agree with 100%, you're probably in a cult. Amen. Yeah. Okay, so my job here may be just to prove that this is not a cult. Uh, but we can disagree without being disagreeable. I want to just deal with information and help people make truly informed decisions. Um, but part of the problem with this, of course, is we bring various assumptions into what, whatever situation we're in. Now, I probably tipped off most people <laughs> this morning. Um, but if I were to ask people what sorts of characteristics they would think of when somebody says a healthy diet, now I'm going to look for some input from the audience. What do you think? If somebody says healthy diet, what do you think? Balance. Balance. There's a good word. I hate it. Great word. <laughs> Steak and baked potato. You're half right. <laughs> Fruits and vegetables. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Milk. Okay. I think I tipped you off this morning. Anyone else? Healthy whole grain. Fiber, oh, paleo, uh, yeah, okay. So unfortunately, the conversation in the United States has been dominated by this concept of heart healthy, is what we mean by a healthy diet. This is so bad 
that when you hear people using a term nutrient dense, just remember that has an official definition. And what that official definition includes is the implicit assumption that we're talking about low fat. Because the Einsteins that came up with this don't consider fat a nutrient. So they think fat just dilutes the nutrients in the food. This is how bad it is. This is how closely you have to watch these people and make sure you understand what the words mean that they're using. Otherwise, we can think we're agreeing when we're having a conversation, but we really fundamentally disagree, right? Got it? Okay. And so we no longer use the food pyramid, right? We've got my plate and all kinds of other things. But basically, it's still this idea that the human diet needs to be based on animal, uh, sorry, plant products, specifically cereal products. That that somehow is supposed to represent the, the, the bulk of the calories that we're going to consume. And where do your products reside? Toward the top, the eat less because this will kill you category. <laughs> and given that this is the product of your tax dollars, how does that feel? Well, I don't like it much. America has had a bizarre relationship with health food that goes back to the 19th century. These two gentlemen, Sylvester Graham, anyone remember the cracker? Yeah, yeah, okay, that's him. That was one of the first, you know, wonder health foods, the Graham cracker. And then John Harvey Kellogg. These are two religiously motivated individuals. These two gentlemen believe that the moral ills of society would be eliminated if we could get people to eat bland, plant-based diets. In fact, I believe the quote from Mr. Kellogg goes something like, he believed that meat eating turned women into lustful harpies. Why this is a problem, I don't know, but apparently, <laughs> apparently he thought this was a huge problem. And from him, we have the breakfast cereal industry. Right? <laughs> OK, so attitude. If I say cholesterol, do you think, oops, back. Right. Do you think harmful or essential? <coughs> right? You best be thinking essential. Right? If if you your ever almost every cell in your body will make cholesterol. If you eat less, your body will make more. Why is that happening? I'm not doing a thing. Um, it, if you eat more, your body will make less. Um, it's a fundamental molecule, absolutely essential for animal life. Uh, if I say saturated fat, does the modifying phrase artery clogging spring to mind? Is there any truth to the idea that saturated fat clogs your arteries? What the heck is going on? Um, so you think if we put a basset on a treadmill, we can turn him into a greyhound? <laughs> you know. Biology isn't fair. I heard somebody say they got into genealogy so they could figure out who to blame. Right? You know, if you put a basset on a treadmill, you might you might get a lean basset, but you're not going to change his body type. It's still going to be a basset. Do you really believe you are what you eat? Yes. Well, here's a hint. This is grass. These are not. This is grass. This is high fiber, low fat, low in protein, and the protein is poor quality. And these are not. You are what your body does with what you eat. And what we now know is the more saturated fat you eat, the less you'll have circulating in your bloodstream. Who manages? Okay, this one's tricky. I think this t-shirt, the slogan, knowledge is power, I think this was some kind of extension thing. I, I tried to take this picture, but nobody knows it. Um, I mean, this has a human and a spiritual dimension to it for me. 
Because if you've been given false information, you're under some kind of possession, aren't you? If you see a heavy person, do you think lazy, glutton, or do you think perturbed metabolism? If you are operating from a scientific basis, you're believing the latter. But if you ascribe to the official public health message of the United States, you believe the former. You believe that a heavy person is heavy because they eat too much and they don't exercise enough. Neither one of those is true. In the 30s, poor health was blamed on a lack of meat and dairy products in the diet. Every woman knows that carbohydrates are fattening. This is a piece of common knowledge which few nutritionists would dispute, 1963. British Journal of Nutrition. This is a quote from a paper from two of the preeminent British nutritionists. Carbohydrates are fattening. But in the 60s, we swapped the paradigm of the fattening carbohydrate for the heart-healthy, low-fat paradigm. And it was a mistake. There are stronger words you can use, but the state will do. <laughs> Understand that we've got three macronutrients in our diet. We've got carbohydrates, we've got fat, we've got protein. <coughs> Protein's going to stay about the same in our diet. <coughs> and so what's going to happen is that fat and carbohydrate are going to vary inversely, like a seesaw. So if I push down the content of fat in my diet, I'm going to end up eating a high carbohydrate diet, by definition. And then there's what they did to the food that they took the fat out of. Right? So we took full fat yogurt, take the fat out, and now you put you know, basically jam in the bottom of it to give it something mm -hmm. to taste like. So now we have a high sugar breakfast food. Okay. One thing to keep in mind that while in a ruminant, a ruminant has a requirement for two forms of carbohydrate, structural and non-structural. Right. There's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate in human nutrition. None. There's no such thing as a carbohydrate deficiency disorder in a human being. For a modern disease to be related to an old-fashioned food is one of the most ludicrous things I've ever heard in my life, 1973. People were trying to warn against what ended up happening toward the end of the decade, but they weren't listening to it. This happens to be a, a skeleton of an auric, which was the prehistoric cattle, the ancestor of modern cattle. And then this is a cave painting from France about some thousand years old. Note the absence of the sacred soil plant. <laughs> Today, Americans eat less than 60 pounds of beef per day. It's the lowest it's been in my lifetime. At the same time, we're eating whopping amounts of carbohydrate. Remember, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. But we were told we were supposed to be eating the majority of our calories from carbohydrate. So is it a coincidence that we now have this epidemic of diabetes and obesity and other related metabolic diseases? I would suggest not. Let's do a little true and false, shall we? This is, again, more participation. So the statement is that dietary cholesterol has no meaningful effect on total cholesterol levels in your blood. True or false? We've got a 50-50 chance, y'all. False. <laughs> False. It happens to be true. I'll be quickly showing the journal citations. I'm happy to share this. Contact me. I'll share all this information. Note the year 1937. Cholesterol you eat is essentially unrelated to the cholesterol you want. Let that just sink in just a little bit. Okay? Low density lipoprotein cholesterol is a marginal risk factor for coronary heart disease. True or false? It happens to be true. 
I mean, I'll think back to the last time you went to your doctor and your doctor was talking to you about your low density lipoprotein cholesterol. Higher total cholesterol is associated with greater longevity for women and senior survivor sex. True or false? The higher your blood uh, your blood cholesterol, the longer you'll live. It's true. Sisters, whatever your age, the higher your cholesterol, the longer you live. That's what the research would tell us if we would listen. Brothers, <laughs> different sources say different things. 60, 65, once you've attained that age, if you haven't been diagnosed with heart disease. I don't mean high cholesterol, because that's not heart disease. I mean heart disease. Gotten to that age without heart disease, the higher your cholesterol, the longer you'll live. Lower total cholesterol is in fact associated with greater cancer mortality. True or false? You shouldn't have sensed a pattern like that. It's true. Okay? Whenever they, they, they were so focused in their studies on reducing coronary disease mortality that they didn't look at all cause mortality. So we might budge the needle a little bit down in terms of people dying of heart disease, but then when we step back and we look at how many people are still dying, we found there was no change because the rate of cancer deaths went up. Saturated fat does not cause heart disease. That's a true statement. Saturated and total fat consumption is in fact positively associated with longevity translate that. The more saturated fat, the more total fat you eat, the longer you'll live. And the happier you'll be, probably. <laughs> and those two are probably not unrelated. That's what the evidence would tell us if we could listen to that. A low-fat diet will increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. Wait a minute. A low-fat diet is what kind of diet? It's a high-carbohydrate diet. It's the heart healthy diet. And what the evidence from research shows is that it will, in fact, increase your cardiovascular disease risk. Well, that's awkward. We're told to eat that way to avoid heart disease, but the evidence shows hmm, that's interesting. high fat diets, which would be what kind of diet? Low carbohydrate diet. <laughs> Produce greater weight loss, better blood glucose control, and reduce cardiovascular disease risks. That's a true statement. So now, what's the heart healthy portion of this diet? The uh, meal. Yeah. You know that? Yes. This would be okay if you put butter on it. Yeah. <laughs> and cheese. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. So we've been taught to think that all fat and animal products are saturated fat. We talked about this yesterday. It's not, it's a mixture of fatty acids. And what we have in this case is beef, the, the, the fatty acid profile that's in beef, okay? And so 50% of the fat, fatty acids that's in beef is saturated. Now we've been told that we should think of that as bad. I'm gonna call it stable, okay? And, but a third of that is stearic fatty acid, which our bodies convert into oleic acid. Oleic acid is what we get from olive oil, right? Okay, 42% is monounsaturated, but 90% of that is oleic acid, okay? And then we get a varying amount, so polyunsaturated, but it's relatively <coughs> low. So if you do the math, what you find out is that 58% of the fat in beef cattle will improve your LDL to HDL cholesterol ratio. This ratio is a better predictor of risk than LDL alone. The, oops, the remaining 42% will raise your LDL cholesterol, but it will also raise your HDL cholesterol. So it will have no effect on the total cholesterol to HDL ratio, which again, is a better predictor of risk than just looking at LDL cholesterol. And we'll talk about some additional things coming up shortly. 
We'll never get the heart check logo on that because that's a pay to play revenue generating scheme from an industry trade group called the American Heart Association. So again, let's shift the conversation from saturated versus polyunsaturated to stable versus unstable. It's a better way to, to look at it. Bad things happen when we get rancid vegetable oils, and, and they go rancid very quickly. Um, so here we go. Uh, I, I, it took me a while to realize that institutions like the American Diabetes Association and the American Heart Association were not patient advocacy groups. Now, I'm sure they mean well, but at the end of the day, they're trade organizations. And just, you know, funding for these organizations. <laughs> yeah. Might there be a conflict of interest here? <laughs> so, 2003 survey done, 93% of the physicians did not know that a low fat, which would be what kind of diet? High carbohydrate diet, in general would increase blood triglycerides. 75% did not know that a low fat diet, which would be what kind of diet? High carbohydrate diet would decrease HDL cholesterol. 50% in fact thought that a low fat diet would not change HDL cholesterol. And 50% did not know that carbohydrate was the diet component most likely to raise triglycerides. So brief review, raising triglycerides, depressing HDL cholesterol, increasing risk of heart disease. Low fat, high carbohydrate, heart healthy in quotes diet will increase your risk of cardiovascular disease by increasing triglycerides and depressing HDL cholesterol. And it will do, again, something else, which is affect the particle nature of LDL cholesterol, uh, low density lipoprotein particles, which are the specific boats that you know, the LDL cholesterol is packaged in. And it will shift those towards a more uh, disease producing <coughs> version. So, again, if this is news to you, what does it say that a forage agronomist is the one that's delivering it to you? And why is your industry not delivering it to you? Maybe there's something we can do about that. Happy to help. Again, we've all been on living subjects in a long observational study. Thank you for participating, by the way. Thank you for signing the consent form, right? Because you can't be involved in studies without giving consent, informed consent, right? And, and usually people get paid, so I hope you're making good use of the money. And your parents, some of our grandparents, our children, some of our grandchildren, thank you all for participating. No? Interesting. In my view, it hasn't worked out all that well, which is just a remarkable understatement. Um, so again, evidence, dietary fat, whether saturated or not, does not cause heart disease. Carbohydrates most likely do, due to their effect on the hormone insulin. Refined carbohydrates, starches, and sugars are the most likely dietary causes of cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and the other common chronic diseases of modern time. Again, if we could be informed by research rather than policy, rather than belief system, okay, um, there is no meaningful association between meat consumption and cancer. The red herring, you should pardon the expression, about processed meats and cancer, that's a long story. Um, but again, that's more male bovine fecal matter, and I can deal with that if I want. Um, the problem is we've known about this evidence for well over a hundred years. We've had well-trained physicians and medical missionaries going out to remote parts of the world and observing people still eating their traditional diet and then undergoing what's called a nutritional transition. So whatever they did eat, now we bring in refined.
refined sugar, we were getting in refined flour. We knew what they were getting in the way of diseases because these were trained medical people. They could recognize these diseases. And then at the end, you see that these diseases start to show up following the introduction of these foreign foods, if you will. We've called them different things over the years. Oops, diseases of civilization. Yeah, that's a bit arrogant, assuming the people you're with aren't civilized, mm -hmm. right? And okay, so we'll call them Western diseases. Now, because they're everywhere around the world, we can't call them that anymore. So metabolic syndrome is a description. It's a cluster of diseases. If you have one of these, your odds of having another one are increased. Now, the, the, the typical mindset today is that being obese is somehow a causal factor in all these diseases. But again, difference between research and policy, it looks more likely now that obesity is one of these conditions and that insulin resistance itself ought to be in the center. And now we're finding increasing information relating insulin resistance to all these other conditions, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, atherosclerosis, hypertension, high blood pressure, stroke, cancer, asthma, sleep apnea, osteoarthritis, neurodegeneration, including Alzheimer's, gallbladder disease. This is just a partial list. So here I go to Medlin. If you find yourself having abdominal obesity, and again, biology is not fair here, so different measures, men versus women. So it's not just total obesity, it's where we carry it that matters. Serum triglycerides elevated, HDL cholesterol depressed, blood pressure elevated, fasting glucose elevated. If you find yourself with three out of those five, you qualify as having a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. Now I would also ask, what if you only have two? What if you only have one? And the dietary treatment that you want to start on is the restricted carbohydrate diet. That's fairly clear from the literature. And again, if I had one or two, not all three, I'd still go that way. Because you're probably on your way. And these are all risk factors. These are all kind of clumsy. Uh, we have better measurements, but this is, not, this is what we use. Uh, so, okay, we could look at this. If you start looking at the lists of causes of death, and then you start finding those that were listed on the previous slide of metabolic illness, you start seeing why it's much more than just diabetes. If diabetes is part of this spectrum, then all of these underlying are also part of it. We just haven't recognized it. And we're starting to hear people talk about dealing with heart disease by working through the liver, which would represent a significant change. And then because I'm just this kind of rabble rouser, I just want to make sure that the list is complete, make sure that people recognize the third leading cause of death here. And then we've got this down here. So I'm losing patience with medical doctors that are real certain about how we should fix our broken food system. When their medical care system is the third leading cause of death in the United States. If you have metabolic syndrome, you are at increased risk of heart disease and diabetes. Not only that, you're at an increased risk of cancer, and you are at an increased risk of dying of that cancer compared to somebody that doesn't have metabolic syndrome that gets the same form. You've heard about this, right? And all the discussion about red meat and cancer? No. I wonder why that might be. And again, there's evidence. We can look at this. Here's some quotes. 
excess body fat seems to account for between one quarter and one half of the occurrence of many frequent cancer types, breast, colorectal, endometrial, renal cell, adenocarcinoma, in the esophagus in particular. The list is growing. Large and growing body of evidence, and it's causing a lot of people to stay up at night thinking about it. But of course, you've heard about this in the news, right? Isn't that interesting? This gentleman is the president of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. We're talking fairly mainstream here. I have eliminated refined sugar from my diet and eat as little as I possibly can because I believe ultimately it's something I can do to decrease my risk of cancer. If you read a book by a man named Gary Taubes, what you'll uh, th that just came out the end of December, The Case Against Sugar, what you'll read in there is how the sugar industry funded the people that were saying it was saturated fat that was causing heart disease. Overeating fat does not increase cancer rate. Again, more quotes from the same gentleman. Overeating carbohydrates dramatically increases cancer rate. Overeating protein puts you somewhere in between, but overeating protein is very hard to do. Overeating carbohydrates is not hard to do. That's why we're going to have a huge debate about these carbohydrate-based diets. I would certainly also. So remember the dietary guidelines uh, you know, for Americans, this is the 8th edition. This is in place governing all policy from 2015 to 2020. In it, it says, the dietary guidelines is not intended to be used to treat disease. Eat this way, you won't get sick, but if you get sick, don't eat this way, remember? That's awkward, especially when you show up with a disease like diabetes, and chances are they're going to refer you to the healthy eating pattern. But it's, that's not intended for diabetes. They say so. And remember, 52% of adult Americans now have diabetes or prediabetes. So most Americans are not intended to eat according to the dietary guidelines of America. Okay. This is this is a study where this what what do you call that magenta? I'm terrible with the colors. So I think that's magenta. That's what we call a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. And we're comparing that to a low fat diet, the blue bar. And these are people that have metabolic syndrome and diabetes. We see is greater body mass loss on the very low carbohydrate diet than on the heart healthy quote unquote diet. We see more loss of abdominal fat. We see this dramatic decrease in triglycerides. Why might that be? What raises triglycerides in the blood? Carbohydrates. Okay. We see this dramatic increase in HDL cholesterol, actually a small decrease on the heart healthy diet. The ratio then is just the math. This is a measure of the ratio between good and undesirable LDL particles. And so what we see is a decrease, that's, that's an improvement. We actually see it going the wrong direction on the low fat diet. Here we have the small LDL, that's the particles we don't want. Increase on the low fat diet, dramatic decrease on the uh, low carbohydrate diet. Um, you know, fasting glucose reduced, whopping decrease in fasting insulin, and then total saturated fat in the circulation. Remember I said the more saturated fat you eat, the less in your blood. Every one of those indicates a substantial reduction in risk on the low carbohydrate diet compared to what we're told is the heart healthy diet. Okay. 
very quickly, this is a subject that comes up a lot, so I just want to show some evidence. I think the, the, the elephant in the room is hyperinsulinemia. And I think there may be lots of mice scurrying around the floorboards. But until we deal with the elephant, we can't possibly know about the impact of some of these other things. Okay? This is ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids in grass-fed beef, grain-fed beef. These two were from a study done. Susan Duckett collaborated. This is Clemson University. Then they went to the supermarket and they bought these other five blue bar items. Ribeye steak, chicken breast, chicken breast skinless, chicken thigh, and a pork chop. Then my friend Adele Height dropped in here the ratio for soybean oil. Okay, if we get locked into looking for ratios, we're going to be looking at the wrong thing. Now, where we got the four to one, I think, is questionable. The whole story is questionable, but let's just accept four to one as somehow this target we're looking for. Okay, so yes, we can see that the grass-fed beef is well below that four to one. The grain-fed beef in that case is slightly above. And if that is your overarching guiding principle, that's fine. That's wonderful. But then, of course, you're not going to be eating pork or chicken. Right? Because pork and chicken as monogastrics don't, their diet far more influences the fat than a ruminant does, which is one of the benefits of a ruminant. They detoxify these substances. Okay, you should get really suspicious that you're seeing this be better than chicken. That can't be right. And you're right. Because if we look at the total amount now, this is what you get from two tablespoons, sorry, one tablespoon of soybean oil. This is what you're getting from your beef. This is what you're getting from your ribeye from the supermarket. Okay? So I'm going to say that eating beef, regardless of how it's finished, is not a rich source of either omega-6 or omega-3. Now, there's all kinds of stories out there. I just want us to slow our roll a little bit on this. And especially if somebody is eating vegetable oils, they're not going to see any benefit. And in fact, if somebody's paying name the price for a grass-fed steak, and then they eat a handful of walnuts. They just ruined that whole thing. Okay, so hyperinsulinemia, then look at vegetable oils. Uh, this just to, is to show the variation that we can have in these ratios. These are study, you know, published studies. And this is grass-fed versus grain-finished, right? And you can see the vast spread in those numbers. These things vary based on breed. They vary based on time of year, what muscle is sample, all kinds of things impact this. And at the end of the day, how important is this? Okay. The ounces of cooked ground beef needed to supply omega-3 provided by one ounce of cooked wild-caught salmon. You have to eat 145 ounces of cooked ground conventional beef in order to get the omega-3 you get from one ounce. Or, okay, get your grass fed, it would only take you 48 ounces. Really? I mean, I have no problem with eating 48 ounces of ground beef, but, um, okay, sorry. Um, and, and again, this is the point. Now remember this number. So let's just think we're only going to be eating cooked, grass-fed ground beef, okay? 48 ounces to equal one ounce of salmon. How many ounces of salmon do you need to eat to counteract two tablespoons of safflower oil? 32 ounces of salmon to 
to counteract the omega-6 you get from two tablespoons. Of, that's salad dressing. And it would be 48 ounces of beef times the 32 ounces of salmon to get the, right? But you'd never get there because you're always going to get more omega-6 slightly than omega-3 from beef. Just the nature of the beast. So again, I, I want us to be a little circumspect. I'm all for grazing management. I hope I've made that clear by now. I'm all for ruminant agriculture. I just want us to be a little cautious in this area. Uh, this is the crime. This is a war on women. 40% uh, of Americans don't get enough protein. And most females over the age of eight don't get enough protein. And this is worse because these statistics consider plant protein and animal protein as equivalent. And they are not. Okay, so the numbers are worse. That's in America. So I'm suggesting the problem isn't the grain fed cattle, it's the grain fed people. So animal products are in fact part healthy. They should be considered health food. And meat is medicine. Okay? Amen. So what's next? Become educated. I hope I've started a process or contributed to one that you're already on. Uh, here's a good book, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It by Gary Towns. He's got two other books that I also recommend. But this is a good one just dealing with what regulates fat metabolism in human beings. Okay? Um, anybody here heard Nina Teicholz or read The Big Fat Surprise by Butter, Meat, and Cheese Belong in a Healthy Diet? Okay. Recommend this book. This book focuses on how we came to believe that saturated fat is somehow a health hazard. Gain experience if necessary. When I listed the, the, the symptoms of metabolic syndrome, if the shoes started to pinch just a little bit, you know, and you want to do something about it. This is the diet that I started following 10 years ago, and more or less, I'm still on it. It's a good book, solid information there in the process of doing a revision, but it, it's still good stuff. The Protein Power Life Plan by Michael and Mary Dan Eads, E-A-D-E-S. Uh, challenge the narrative. This is the ruminant revolution. This is the ruminati. This is learning enough for us to feel confident in engaging with the public or relatives or students or health care providers, whatever, wherever, having the influence that they can. And then find your position of influence. I think I found mine. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here to be a part of the Gracing Conference. I hope I've given you some, you should part of the expression, food for thought. Um, and I, if you have any suggestions, if you have any comments, um, please feel free to talk with me, uh, email me. Uh, if you want to get involved in some projects, please let me know. So with that, it's a thank you, and if there are any questions. Um, and how are we doing on time? You have about 15 minutes. Oh, we have 15 minutes. Wow, that's exceptional for me. Thank you. <laughs> Tell me what part of the statement isn't true. Inflammation caused by overconsumption of carbohydrates causes the body to increase cholesterol production, thereby creating coronary artery. Okay, so the, the, the statement was, and the request was to what part of the statement is not true. Inflammation caused by overconsumption of carbohydrates causes the body to increase cholesterol production, <laughs> thereby creating coronary heart disease. So let me take that in a couple steps. One say that um, blaming heart disease on cholesterol is like blaming house fires on the firemen. Okay? Well, you always see firemen in the house fire. Right? Well, they're showing up to deal with the situation that the inflammation created. And so, to a degree, yes, the hyperinsulinemia is inflammatory. And then hyperinsulinemia is probably incorporated with or, or, or uh, accompanies uh, LDL particles that 
are small and dense and oxidized LDL, and that's what's getting into the lining of the vessel, and that's what's causing the plaques to start. So substantially agree, but probably with some, some quibbles. Um, again, uh, Dr. Kraft's work would suggest, well, his quote was something along the lines of anyone with heart disease not associated with diabetes is merely undiagnosed as a diabetic. In the back. Uh, husband and wife, uh, Michael and Mary Dan, last name Eads, E-A-D-E-S. I'm not sure I asked this question, but you mentioned earlier that ruminants convert fatty acids in a better way, or is it something that we have to worry about? No. So, so the question is about what, what's happening in the rumen to polyunsaturated fatty acids. So we can't feed very much fat to a ruminant. Right? Too much interferes with proper function. But the polyunsaturated fatty acids that come in get reduced to mono or saturated fatty acids, which then are absorbed by the cow and laid down in fat. And that's a good thing. We've been told that polyunsaturated fats are what we want. The you know canola oil with the heart check logo on it, or the the Rizola. Again, pay to play. Sorry. Was that statement that cow converts it, or when we eat meat? It, it no, the, the cow the converts it yeah. to the, to, to the, the monounsaturated or the saturated fatty acids. So, so the fat in a ruminant is much less influenced by diet than the fat in a pig or in chicken or us or any other monogastric or modified monogastric animal. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, so, so the question was, how bad was I, which, that's an interesting. Um, <laughs> at, at, at my heaviest, I was over 225. One stops measuring after a while, right, okay. Um, my HDL cholesterol was low, my triglycerides were tending high, my um, blood pressure and glucose were all moving in the wrong direction. And basically, by uh, moving to eating diet food like bacon and eggs for breakfast, or um, a scramble with chopped up um, beef, you know, like um, a London broil that I dice up and freeze into portion sizes, uh, scramble that in, uh, in butter with eggs, throw some cheese on it. Um, that would be breakfast, lunch could be that sort of protein serving, which for me is somewhere north of four ounces of meat or equivalent. You know, like there's evidence that says we need to be getting like 30 grams of animal protein or more per meal. So there's about seven grams of protein per ounce of cooked meat or per ounce of hard cheese or per large egg. So you can kind of treat those all as equivalent. I've recently upped my protein intake just a little bit. I'm, I'm pushing it a little bit further. Um, so, but poultry and fish and pork and beef and lamb and goat, all of those are fine. Cured meats are fine. You know, the problem with lunch meats is not what's in them. It's what you serve them on and with that's the issue, right? No, except for us. Very few people sit down to a quarter pound of bologna 
without the bread, the chips, and this, you know, the super mega thing of Pepsi. sugar water, right? Pepsi. But the epidemiologists will tell us that they can factor that out when they determine that uh, baloney is the cause of, you know, I'm, I'm not buying it. Uh, in, in terms, so, so that's where I was. Um, in terms of the doctor, I didn't have a conversation with the doctor. Um, I've, I've, I've gone through the experience of um, various, various employers have these health programs that you need to go in and fill out the form, right? And I'm reading off of my tests. I'm giving you lab values. I know what the lab values mean. But because I'm not giving you the right word answer to your question, you're going to kick me back as being at high risk. Well, it's not risk. And, and I try to be kind to the people that are on the phone because, you know, it's a minimum wage and they don't know. So um, I've learned to answer how many servings of fruit. Well, let's see. I eat avocados. That's fruit. I eat tomatoes. That's fruit. Right? You get the idea. You, you play their game and, and satisfy them that way. <laughs> No, I'm not sodium sensitive. Uh, my wife needs to be a little bit more careful. Again, that's one of the individual things, but we've had blanket recommendations, which are completely inappropriate. Um, and in fact, some people may not be getting enough sodium. And so all of that, I, I think they've done a better job of walking back the sodium recommendations on the 2015 guidelines than they've done with the cholesterol and the fat. The saturated fat, I think, is still no more than 10% of calories from saturated fat. They've loosened it up a little bit on the upper end for total fat, but they want you to get the healthy vegetable oils. And the cholesterol, they still have the wording of not too much. Well, okay, I've got no problem with that because there is no such thing as too much cholesterol. So we're in complete agreement on that one. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm not worried about the sodium. Thank you. Are you aware of any research, say, in the public health community right now that is working to maybe further support the evidence that you just provided? Um, or is everybody kind of focusing on the wrong thing right now? So, so the question is, am I aware of research, public health community, that is reinforcing or trying to further um, this, this line of evidence? And the answer is yes. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that's come out. Uh, there's a number of research communities at uh, Ohio State University, sorry, the Ohio State University. <laughs> <laughs> at the other OSU, because I was a virgin state. You know, so. um, there's a gentleman named Dr. Jeff Volick, and they're doing some very interesting work, and they're doing some really exciting work with diabetics. Um, there was a gentleman in the UC, I think San Francisco community, um, he's now emeritus, but for decades he's worked in this area. Uh, his name is Steve Finney. There's some very exciting work going on with elite athletes, especially in endurance athletes. And, and, and what they're finding is when they can take these people and get them adapted to burning fat instead of glucose, all of a sudden these people just become these consistent machines. And they can train better with less injury, quicker recovery. They can just strike um, a, a, a pace and maintain it. So we're seeing a lot of evidence in sport uh, around the world. Uh, there are people, Tim Noakes, N-O-A-K-E-S. I mentioned him this morning. Um, He's in South Africa, look up the Noakes Foundation. They're doing some very exciting work in that part of the world. Uh, and again, he was you know, one of the big wigs as far as endurance running and, and you know, heart loading in that community. Um, I was mentioning earlier that there are various court, quasi-court cases. You know, medical authorities have their own governing you know, processes. And so in, in Australia, there's an orthopedic surgeon. You know, these are the people that are lopping off toes and feet and 
lower legs and upper legs, because of poorly managed diabetes, um, he became just, uh, he got involved with low carbohydrate for people with diabetes. He was reported, he's now censured, and the charge, this is Orwellian, inappropriately curing diabetes. <laughs> Inappropriately curing diabetes. So he's been silenced. But he has cured. Oh, yeah. But inappropriately. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll say it's not the way we say it should be. Is the American Medical Association in on this, what we're describing here? Well, the American Medical Association is a big group. There's a group called the American, uh, American Society of Bariatric Physicians which is the group that specializes in the treatment of obesity. They're not all surgeons, okay? In there, you will find, in the obesity medicine community, not surprisingly, more awareness and acceptance of this topic. Uh, again, if you look in the, the, what are they called, hepatologists? Uh, sorry? No, hepatologists, okay. liver function. These are the people that are figuring out that um, insulin resistance is, sorry, in the liver. And that's what then leads to heart disease. Um, and so they're doing some interesting work in that community and expect to see that growing more. Um, and yes, uh, Eric Westman, Duke University Medical Center, they have a lifestyle medicine. And so you can find stuff that they've done Again, in this area, um, there are a number of physicians. If you want a really good website, lots of these kinds of talks, dietdoctor.com. Dietdoctor.com. It's from Sweden. They have a free access part with lots of information. And then I think it's like seven or nine dollars a month. Free first month and then you know subscription after. They don't take they don't take uh, advertisements, they don't take money, except through the subscriptions. And then they post all kinds of videos, interviews, lectures from some of these very same people. Um, and the story, I showed the, the butter consumption and then, you know, the, the butter smuggling this morning. That story is a physician in Sweden who I think she was type two, or at least she was heavy herself. She, as a physician, put herself on a restricted carbohydrate diet. She lost a bunch of weight. Her patients are going, what are you doing, doc? And she says, well, this is what I'm doing. And so they did this, and then she got reported, and her license to practice medicine got pulled by the governing authority. It took two years to get it back. She can now practice medicine. And, but what it did was it caused all this publicity and the news got out. And, and now you see that something like a quarter of the Swedes are trying some fer version of re low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And, and then she is in diabetes education. She goes and services various communities. The way their medical system works is whatever supplies they buy, somebody in the authority can track that. And so she was getting calls from these you know, supply trackers who were saying, why are your patients dying? What are you talking about? Well, the, the sales or purchases of these supplies in this community have fallen by three quarters. Like, yeah, they don't need them. They didn't die. They just don't need to buy it anymore. But of course, the mindset is the only reason for a decrease in sales is because they die. So, yeah, we're seeing different results in different parts of the world. In the United States, there are people that I'm now known by, and I, you know, so I'm happy to make introductions. Are we going to change the methods? Rating system shows 
So, so the question was, how are we going to change the message from the local beef councils? Um, and you know, people can inform me better about how they function. My estimation is that we have people who are nutrition professionals in the employ of the organization at some level. These are people who promote something called the DASH diet. And they, we, we need to work with them to get them educated about different information. Part of my strategy, and I may be too clever by half, is to say, okay, we're not talking about what constitutes a healthy diet. Uh, I don't, let, let's just leave that off to the side here. I want to focus on how somebody who's got diabetes or prediabetes should eat. Because again, remember the dietary guidelines isn't for those people. So now we can avoid that conversation. And I think people of goodwill need an out. But I understand being wrong, believe me. Good thing my wife isn't here. Um, so, you know, if, if you're sincerely wrong and you're presented with different information and that's done in an effective and open way, then we have the opportunity to change minds and to change the reality. Um, there are, however, people who won't change. They do know the truth. And we just need to sort those people out uh, and, and deal appropriately. My grandmother used to ride about the sun up. She had a place in the barn and milk the three cows and skim uh, the milk off the cream off. Turn butter and so on, but fix bread, bacon, and eggs. And then she'd go work in the garden if it got too hot. She'd come back and she'd pour cream in a glass, crack two raw, unwashed eggs in it, stir it up and drink it. And then she'd do her household chores. Then in the afternoon, she'd walk two and a half miles to coal camp to sell butter and eggs. Uh huh. She's supposed to have an adequate diet and uh, proper lifestyle. She's still good with She died about 30 years. Don't want to see that diet killed her tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's not, yeah, yeah. It, good point. I think. I think our uh, one more question. I worked in healthcare for several years. Insurance company. Mm -hmm. um, I worked for a chiropractor. I see the trend of people that would come to the chiropractor for relief of pain in about three months. After Mm, mm, mm. And I would ask, that's one of the things we have, now have to ask, have you started any new medications? Three months ago, my doctor put me on a cholesterol. Do you take a blood pressure? Yes, I take medicine for blood pressure. Three months is what I get. Mm -hmm. Some of them lasted about six months, but three months was general. So the, the, the multiple effects that medication provide, or produce, um, there's a whole story behind that. There's an interesting story with insurance, and I'm not sure how the Affordable Care Act got in the way of this, but there were some insurance companies that were beginning to say, wait a minute. Um, I think this was in Reno. There was a municipality, so some first responders, you know, if, if you have a heart attack, it's a full, full pension disability because it's a work-related injury. So in addition to the personal, we lost a human being or somehow their impact. There was a financial impact as well. And what they came up with was a more informed risk profile survey. And what they discovered was there were several of these men that they, or sorry, first responders that they looked at that were dead men walking. You know, they, they were at extraordinarily high risk despite being outwardly fit, okay? One happened to be, I think, the fire chief and the other was the chief of police. Ooh. And so then what they did was they implemented this wellness program but informed by the science. And so people 
got effective dietary intervention. They got more informed screening information. They, you know, there were certain things that they were expected to incorporate into their life, and it was a performance issue. Right? You will have time to do this, and if you don't do it, it's a chip on your, you know, right? So, and then they see this dramatic reduction in their risk profile. So if we can do that kind of thing, we can have a huge impact. If, if, if not, then you're still stumbling down the same path. So let, let, I'm sorry. Let, let's thank Dr. Milestead for his, his talk. Thank you. I hereby declare a guilt-free zone. <laughs> And then the yeah. other thing is just environment yeah. and stress and things can cause yeah. Yeah. But I, I believe that we got off on a you know, tangent with cholesterol. I, I think it was a distraction mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, indeed, they're making, what, 20-some billion dollars a year off of one class of medication. Yeah. I have a question. 